Good evening. I'm calling to order the meeting of the Arlington School Committee on Thursday, April 28th. I'm Liz Exton, uh, the chair. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are pre present and can hear me. When I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. I don't think we need to do this for the people in the room. So, Dr. Janger. Hi, Dr. Janger here. Thank you. And then we're expecting um, Amy Shellaru at some point as our AHS rep. <clears throat> Uh, tonight's meeting of the Arlington School Committee is being conducted in a hybrid model. On February 15th, 2022, Governor Baker signed into law a new session law extending certain COVID-19 related measures. The new law, Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, includes an extension until July 15th, 2022 of the remote meeting provisions of the Governor's March 12th, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. The governor's order, which is referenced with agenda materials on the town's website for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Before we begin, permit me to offer a few notes. <clears throat> First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom, is being recorded, and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that they may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of, interests of developing a record of the meeting. All participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the Novus agenda platform. And finally, each vote tonight will be taken by roll call. All right, our first item on, agen on the agenda is the school committee public hearing on school choice. So this is something that we need to do every year. It is the policy of this school district not to admit non-resident students under the terms and conditions of the interdistrict school choice law, Massachusetts General Law 76, Chapter 12. This decision must be reaffirmed annually prior to June 1st by a vote of the school committee following a public hearing. So I will open the public hearing on school choice. Is there anyone here who would like to speak on school choice? Seeing no one, we need we to. If, anybody on oh. to speak on, I mean, if anybody is a participant on an attendee on Zoom, they can raise their um, virtual hand. Okay, Mr. Slickman. Madam Chair, I move that we direct the superintendent to notify the board of uh, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education that Arlington will not be participating in the school choice uh, program for the 2022-23 school year uh, for the reason of no available seats. Second. All right, a motion by Mr. Schlickman, second by Mr. Hainer. Roll call vote, Mr. Hainer? Uh, yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. And I vote yes, that's a unanimous vote. All right, our next item on the agenda is a nomination and election for the office of vice chair. Um, I am, if anyone would like to say something now, I will let some people speak, but then I'm gonna open this up for nominations and we will vote and then we will move on. Mr. Schlick. Madam Chair, I'm up for re-election next year. I am not certain whether I would choose to continue on the committee beyond the end of this term. For that reason, I will be withdrawing my candidacy. Thank you, Mr. Slipman. I will now open uh, the floor for nominations for vice chair for Arlington School Committee. Ms. Morgan. Um, I'd like to nominate Dr. Allison Ampey for vice chair of the Arlington School Committee. Can I get a second? Second. Any other nominations? Seeing no other nominations, I will now take a roll call vote for um, Dr. Allison Ampey as vice chair of the Arlington 
School Committee. Mr. Hainer. Abstain. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlichtman. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. And I vote yes. That is six in the affirmative and one abstention. Congratulations, Dr. Allison Ampey, you're the vice chair of the school committee. Do you want a trade seat? I sure do. <laughs> Not happy about being here at all. <laughs> Taking my name tag with me. <laughs> okay, well, while they shuffle, I will. Where do I go? You're the secretary. Secretary. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, got set Jane up gets here. to ride. Robert. Just got set up, you know. <laughs> Musical cheers. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next item on the agenda is public comment. For members of the public who wish to address the committee, there will be 20 minutes of public comment. Depending on the number of people who sign up, time allotments may be reduced but will not exceed three minutes each. Dr. Allison Ampi will be the timer and will give the speaker a signal when they have 30 seconds left. If the number of people who sign up exceeds what can be done in 20 minutes, the number of speakers may be capped and will be invited to speak based on the timestamp of their email to Ms. Diggins. The school committee respectfully requests participants of the public to utilize their camera if possible while speaking and to adhere to the public comment policy BEDH that requires participants to provide their name and address. Speakers may offer such objective criticisms of the school operations and programs as concern them, but in public session, the committee will not hear personal complaints about school personnel, nor against any member of the school community, except for the school committee or the superintendent in their capacity as the operational leader of Arlington Public Schools. The public is reminded that the school committee does not hold jurisdiction over the performance of school personnel other than the superintendent. Additionally, the committee will not hear anything that might identify and or infringe upon a student's privacy by name or incident. If you would like to sign up to speak, please email ediggins at arlington.k12.ma.us by 12 noon on the date of the meeting. We have one person signed up for public comment this evening, um, Janine Duffy. You might have to, yeah, you might have to just move it in right in front of you. Yeah. I have to tell you, the last time I was in front of a lot of people like this, it was in court, so <laughs> be, be gentle with me as I do this again. Um, my name is Janine Duffy, and I am a parent of a high school freshman, a sixth grader, and a third grader at Stratton Elementary. I am also a substitute teacher, mainly at Stratton, since November 29th, 2021, where I have been almost every day. I have worked in every class in that building, kindergarten through fifth grade, SLC classes, gym classes, art classes, and my favorite, music. I have worked as the lead teacher or the paraprofe paraprofessional in those classes. I have seen firsthand how the classes work, well and not so well. I am aware there are some discussions about downsizing teachers and increasing class sizes. As a parent, as well as someone who is working in that building almost every day, I want to state I am firmly against getting rid of any teacher, no matter the school, and making class sizes bigger. Many of these students need more one-on-one -on -one assistance for things like math and reading. Not necessarily IEP level help, but help nonetheless. Making classes bigger will not allow teachers to work with these students. Also, larger class sizes are not helpful to those children, not at the social emotional levels they should be, thanks to schooling over the last two years. I am a parent of children during the first use of modulars at Stratton. It seems super easy to use these modulars again, not problematic. I am uncertain as to why one or two modulars cannot be, cannot be used until a way to make Stratton bigger is figured out, possibly moving the fourth or fifth grades to those modulars to make space for smaller, cla to make space for smaller classes 
is an option that could possibly work to ease lack of space issues in that building. I truly feel class size should either be kept the same or smaller. I am not happy that my soon to be fourth grader will be in a class with possibly 25 children or more in that class. I am hopeful that school enrollment increases as Arlington is a great town to raise children in. And I truly hope any teacher who may be told to start looking elsewhere is able to stay within the Arlington School District. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. All right. Um, next on our agenda is the AHS student representative to the school committee, Amy, but I'm not seeing her on. Okay, if she comes, we can loop back to her. Um, so we'll move on to our next agenda item, a uh, report from CPAC on the survey that they shared with the community. So um, welcome Sarah Burton, Ine Huang, and Jessica Dombrowski. And you'll need to pass that mic along as you um, are speaking. Okay. And someone's going to share <laughs> their slides. She's got them. Oh, boy. Um, I guess I am. I thought you had. I don't have yours. I have Ron's. But I can find them. <coughs> well, I love these slides. <laughs> I'm not signed in. I got it. I got it, Liz. I just have to sign into the meeting. Is this going to work for them? No, it'll be fine. Hold on. Yes, it'll work. Is that going to work? I'll come get it. It's going to work. Hold on. <laughs> that, the clicker will not work, so I will, I'll oh, advance it for work? you. Okay. Just tell me when you're ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yep. Thank you for having us today on your agenda. As you know, we are Special Education Parent Advisory Council, which is mandated by Massachusetts state law for every district that has a special education department. Our volunteer board members are Ine Wong, our chair, Sarah Barton, our co-chair, and I am Jessica Dombrowski, CPAC secretary. We conducted a survey to determine how well CPAC was known to parents in the district and also to identify the parent concerns. Uh, we based our survey on surveys of others, other area CPACs. And uh, in order to distribute the survey, we sent it out to the superintendent newsletter, to our own listserv, and to our Facebook page. We realized that the survey was only available online and in English. And we also knew that the people who were responding to our survey were already highly involved in the district. Uh, to go over our survey results, here are Sarah and Ine. Thanks, Jess. There we go. Uh, so a quick look at the makeup of our survey respondents. Um, this is our first year of what we hope will become an annual survey, so this will act as a baseline for comparison in future years. <coughs> Uh, the survey was open from mid-January to mid-February, and we got 136 responses, all of them identified as parents. Of those, 105 reported having one or more child served on an IEP. Um, for context, uh, according to the DESE profile for APS, we currently have around 950 students on IEPs. Um, as you can see from the second graph there, respondents are weighted towards parents of elementary school students, and I think that may be partly because we had quite a few respondents with multiple children at different age groups that kind of end up having at least one in that group, but also I think that um, elementary school is a time of high parent involvement, and I think that's indicated by who completed our slides. Uh, next slide. Oh, one back. There we go. Uh, the largest number of respondents reported autism or ADHD as their child's primary disability. 
uh, followed closely by learning disabilities. And quite a few parents who indicated a learning disability went on to further indicate that their child was dyslexic. The placement data was roughly in line with DESI, as you can see in the second chart, uh, with the exception of that other choice category, which um, includes several students attending Minuteman High School, uh, as well as parents who um, independently placed their children in private school or home school. And I think um, it's important to keep in mind that this is the first year we've done this survey, and I think that there was um, some pent up feedback from uh, previous years from parents who have since left the district, and that's what you're seeing indicated in that other choice kind of category. So before I hand things over to Ine for a more qualitative look at the results of the open-ended questions, um, I want to take a quick look at these questions um, that we asked about the district on a five-point scale. So one was strongly disagree and five was strongly agree. Um, I think they tell the story of the data as the whole and what you'll hear from some of the, the quotes that we have coming up. So the first question was, I know who to contact regarding my student's IEP and I feel comfortable doing so. And you can see from the, the graph that that's a very positive result. So most people in this district with a child on an IEP who responded to our survey felt like they knew who to contact and they were happy to do so. Things start to level out with the second question, which was, I feel like an equal partner with APS. Um, and then the third question, I feel like my student's rate of progress is measured effectively uh, has a negative trend. So we have more answers in that one or two than we do in the four or five. And I think the story that we're seeing here, um, and which Ine is gonna pick up on in just a second, is of very engaged parents who are comfortable reaching out, but who are feeling sort of less confident when they're, they're actually having that conversation. So the response that they're getting is, is the one that's in the middle there. So once, you're, once you've reached out and are in conversation, that conversation is mixed as far as how it's going. And then um, in that final graph, I think you're seeing frustration of trying to understand exactly why and how the district is making decisions for their children um, and tracking the outcomes of those choices, which I think is where the frustration is coming from in those conversations. So Ine, I will turn it over to you on the next slide. Great. So uh, because I don't want to crane my neck, can I pull up the... Can you pull up where we are? Right, so I have more of the qualitative work. So uh, I'm just going to stop here for half a second. So this is what I'm going to go over as our key takeaways from our, our um, presentation here. <coughs> Next. So um, first, we have a couple of um, strengths in our very caring and competent staff. People reported m multiple times. Oh, can Next you switch slides? slides? Um, that uh, if, I don't know if you can all read that there are we have so many quotes about how loved our staff members are how many teachers are loved um, and uh, to move on to the next slide that goes in hand with we'd love to see better retention and I know that we as a district are working on this we've we've put in that the the five-year plan to increase budgeting and I know that COVID has really put a dent in our ability to hire as as quickly and as uh, well as we'd like but it does, you know, in this next steps slide, it, it, the quotes really were like, I had a different coordinator every single solitary year that we've been doing our IEP process thus far. And that doesn't lead to good communication and feeling as if families feel uh, supported by the district. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Um, most families are incredibly enthusiastic about seeing more SEL content across the board. Obviously, most of our respondents were in the lower grades, which is where the big push has been thus far. We are moving into uh, some number of middle schoolers. Our, our families are seeing that their kid is coming home with more of that content, and they're enthusiastic about that. Um, but, um, but the concern is that there, there is increased absenteeism, and at the lower grades, under on, uh, the K-8 numbers are increasing, not decreasing, and um, and a lot of school refusal is about social emotional learning and social emotional support in our in our district, and I think that's indicative of that. Um, 
one of the other pieces which we're actually going to address at the state level is, is how do we also ch change ab absenteeism, which is a social, emotional, mental health often issue, into one that is not a, a penalty-driven, you know, truancy issue, so that it's actually about supporting families and students better in our schools and in our, in our districts. So uh, we're actually going to be speaking with Sean Garbley at our next meeting um, to try to bring that up at the state level as well. But we want to bring that to the school committee and to our district as a whole to know that this is a trend we're seeing and have been seeing for quite some time. Next slide. I'm going through this quickly. Uh, <laughs> communication and transparency. Um, show me the data. Like, we are, we are collecting data across the board. I know that we are. It's happening all of the time. But as parents, we don't have ready access to that data, and we don't have all of the information on how that data was collected. collected. So we'd love to see a, a sort of a, a place where what data is being collected, how is it being collected, what type of testing are we doing, what's a sort of like just a rundown of what are we doing with the data that's being collected, and what is that data? Um, uh, do you want to do um, start of the process first? Sorry? Do you want to do start? Starting in special ed communication. Well, in a minute. <laughs> it's good. Um, and uh, and and we'd love to see you know some more of the tools that teams are using. Um, the other piece is is the the ability to access special ed has been a challenge for a lot of families. They don't know how. That's actually the number one phone call slash email that I get personally because I put my personal information up on our web page. Uh, is how do, I, how do I start the process? And while we do a basic rights workshop that, um, that Allison Elmer helps sponsor every year, it's, it's a huge information dump. Um, and it's very difficult for a lot of families to really go to that and feel that they understand what they're supposed to do to get that process started. It also only happens once a year, and children struggle all year long. Uh, so we as CPAC, uh, in conjunction with Ms. Elmer, are working on creating a beginner's fact sheet so that it can be available in every building so they know that what the sort of process should look like. Um, not the whole process, but just the how do we get our kid assessed, what does that mean, what's the timeline, just the basic first steps. Um, and we, having spoken to Ms. Elmer, and we actually did bring this up with Dr. Homan, would love to see the district as a, and also actually uh, Mr. Maringer behind us, uh, we'd love to see a fact sheet of, or some sort of presentation for families to understand what types of supports are actually happening every day. What does tier one support mean? What does MTSS actually look like? What are they doing in the, that time? Who's doing it? How are we evaluating? Um, many families have not a single clue what that means or don't have a robust enough understanding of what that is to figure out whether or not they feel that their kid is being supported if, if, if this district even knows that their child is st struggling yet when they're seeing their, these struggles at home. So we'd love to see those be created, right? What is RTI? All of these acronyms that those, those of us in education understand but not everyone else does. Um, what was the next thing? Next slide. Oh, that was to show me the data. Yep. <laughs> I skipped ahead. You can skip ahead to the next one after that, too. Um, uh, communication inter school and uh, between schools and within schools. Um, there is information that seems to not cross borders between schools. The, there, when a kid is moving up into with a 504, for instance, we're hearing this from 504 families mm -hmm. who are often people who have had IEPs as mm -hmm. well. Um, not all that information seems to get transmitted to the next building. Um, not every service provider for a kiddo seems to know what other service providers are also doing, and there is some amount of overlap sometimes. So we would love to, to just know that this is something that's being worked on. Um, and we actually applaud the district for um, promoting Ms. Elmer into an, an assistant superintendentship for student services because we feel this will actually help communication across things like SEL and guidance and special ed have better lines of communication and therefore better communication out to families. Um, move on to, uh, oh, instruction path. Um, reading curriculum. So we did this back in December? January, February. January, February. So we, we created this survey back in November and 
uh, working on November, December, and uh, which is also the time you all were talking about and creating and, and coming up with better um, ways of, of reading instruction. And so the thing we got from a lot of the parents is this, as you guys were doing this too, is uh, they'd love to be a part of the process. They want to be involved in how you create, um, you know, and, and bring in and support that, that initiative. Um, so that was one. The other thing is a lot of people said, we'd love to see PDs for neurodiverse folks being done by neurodiverse folks, and not just in special ed, not just for, us, for our service providers, but for our general educators as well. Uh, a lot of people are finding that while there is the occasional general educator that seems to be up on this data, most of them really don't understand that about half their classroom is actually neurodiverse. Uh, and, and they're not quite, to use a, a, a layman's term, grokking the, the process of what's going on in other people's heads in that classroom. So we'd love to see them come, you know, people who have some, who identify as neurodiverse come in and actually do PDs for our, for our faculty and staff. Um, and uh, finally, um, again, communication, communication, communication. Uh, we'd, we'd love to see more of it, hear more of it, and have it be more clear. Um, and, and as a CPAC, we, we'd love to be better utilized, honestly. I think that we can get messaging out to families better in ways that are more readily digestible than sometimes the district does. And, and conversely, we'd love to actually be able to participate more on uh, district decisions on what's happening um, and how we're coming up with new initiatives. And that is the whole shebang, and I did it, well, not as quickly as I do. It's a lot of information. Questions? Thank you. Um, questions from the committee? Mr. Slickman? I'm impressed by the report. I also, <clears throat> by, by, by my very nature, worry about the stories that are not being told. Um, and I'm sure you're aware that, you know, I'm looking at the um, 135 responses and I figure that we've got about 930 or so special uh, students with disabilities in the district. So we're catching about 15% of the population with the survey. Um, I, I would guess it's actually closer to 20 because many, many families have more than one. More right. than one child. Yeah, that's, that's a valid point. The other thing is I'm looking at your distribution and the responses, half, half the responses came from grades three to five, uh, which is probably, which makes a lot of sense in my mind, is th this is at the age where people are into the system long enough so they're interacting with it, they're, they're aware of it, they've had experiences and can more likely to make a response. So my question really is, Looking at the high school, looking at Otteson, looking at the people who are not represented demographically by the distribution, do you think there's something that we need to go looking for that isn't reflected in the results? Um, I think that's always the case. I mean, we did state up front that, mm. that there are real limitations to this survey, yeah. and, and, and I think that that you know, um, we didn't take any real demographic data of families, um, and so that would be an interesting look at what populations we may also be missing. But if, if these are the complaints of the most engaged families, because mm -hmm. they're going to be the ones that are most likely to uh, participate, right? Mm -hmm. um, if these are the people with the best access and these are the, 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 the concerns they already have, uh, it, it really does mean that we have bigger and greater problems for those who have a harder time accessing everything, from language learners mm -hmm. to people whose parenting and family systems are not as privileged. It just is. It um, is. It but is, this is, is a place to start from, mm -hmm. and this is a place to grow from. Was this a very small survey because you're showing us three questions? No, there were. So. Um, the survey also had a component of questions that were more CPAC focused. So is, is CPAC useful for you? Um, what kind of you know, workshops would you like to see from CPAC? Mm -hmm. Do you have a suggestion for um, 
CPAC. Because I really like your use of so, statements here and the strongly agree to st uh, strongly disagree paradigm. I think it's a very good way to construct a, a survey. Um, and then the other the other component that's not really discussed here was um, there was a small section on um, sort of COVID related mm -hmm. discrepancies. So did you feel as though you lost any services and were were they compensated for, um, but the data from that was just so fuzzy and people's understanding of whether they had or had not received services um, was really fuzzy. Was very fuzzy, so sometimes mm -hmm. parents are, are replying that they don't feel that they received enough services, mm -hmm. but that's a different question than whether or not you've been mm -hmm. denied services. So that was, that was more difficult to draw conclusions from. Sometimes fuzzy questions lead to good questions, so you know, keep, keep on keeping on. I mean, I'm really interested in what you're doing, and I think this, this is really good conversation. We're starting to happen. I hope we continue to do this more, and you, span, uh, you learn from your fuzziness and do another survey and get more participation. But uh, congratulations on this work. I'm very, very pleased with what I'm seeing in, in, in the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Cardin. Thank you. Uh, I would also want to thank you all for your hard work over the years. I know you've Several of you have been officers for a very long time, so thank you for, for keeping the CPAC running and for doing this survey, because it takes a lot of work to put it together. Um, so just a couple of comments and, and thoughts um, for, for Ms. Elmer and, and Dr. Holman to help follow up on. So communication is, is very important, and I think helping CPAC communicate is also something that we can do. Um, in the past, we didn't have emails from parents, but now we have parents getting documents through Easy IEP. We should have a easier way to email parents that are special education parents um, to say we have a CPAC meeting coming up, we have a survey, we have this seminar happening, so hopefully we can start doing that in a, in a, in a more um, uh, institutional manner to help you yeah, communicate the, the with parents. The challenge is that they're, they're not quite aligned with PowerSchool, and so uh, hmm. that's how mo the majority of emails go out, so it's actually an IT problem. We've, yeah. we've discussed this in the past, okay. so, uh, you know. Yeah. And then you make a very good point about MTSS. If you look at our website, there's really no information about it. Um, other, other districts have at least a sheet describing what it is, not, not as much detail as they should. But um, so obviously, I think that's something we should, as a to-do, we should um, work on. Um, and the child find, the, the whole, um, you know, besides putting out that statement in the, I guess it's still in the newspaper, <laughs> that if you, you know, have an issue, you contact um, Arlington Schools. But for current parents that are already in the district, um, I think you know, reminding them about, about how to request an evaluation, talking to your teacher, getting, I, I forget what the teams are called at the elementary school that meet um, weekly to, to review. Student support teams. Yeah, yeah. Um, the support, student support teams, just, uh, just communicating <coughs> to parents that those are available um, because it's almost like it's a secret, so. So I have an anecdote there for student support teams because I agree with you. Um, I'm a very clued in parent, right? And I have a child with an IEP. And for my younger child who is, is not on an IEP, I had some concerns. And because I was already clued in, I could go speak with the social worker. And she said, oh, the teacher already flagged him for a student support team meeting and we've already put these various structures in place. And I had no idea that that was even a possibility and I felt much better knowing that that level of support was available because I knew that probably we would not qualify for any sort of special education or as a disability or not accessing the curriculum, but there was a need for support there and I didn't even know that teachers were meeting, teams of teachers were meeting in that way yeah. um, to address it. So I really think this could be an easy win for the district if we're already more information it. was out about what support does already occur. Yeah. And then the, the last issue that, that you raised, which is also very important, is, is the turnover issue. I see that we're already advertising for two team chairs at the elementary school for next year. Um, I, you know, I don't know, we need, we need to start, if we're not tracking the data, we need to start tracking the data on team chairs and coordinators in particular, because there does seem to be a bit of a revolving door. And I hear, well, it's the same in other districts. Well, let's get data from other districts and compare. Um, to, to verify that because uh, we need to see is it, is it salary, is it people advancing in the careers and it is natural or is it something else that we need to address. So hopefully we can, we can look into that. And, and 
I, I also want to say let's think more than just what other districts are also experiencing. Let's actually survey people and say what is it that they need to stay in a spot, mm -hmm. right? Our families love our providers, so why are we losing them? And many of our providers have also said they really enjoy working with our families. Um, so yes, it happens systemically where there is turnover. Education is a relatively high turnover profession. However, um, there seems to be a higher turnover rate in, in, edu in special education and uh, related services. So, the, the, like I think there's a bigger question than just what are, what are we doing that, that everyone else is also doing. Great, thanks again. I'm Dr. Allison Ampey. Thank you for the, your presentation that was really helpful. Um, I wanted to follow up on one question that Glenn had mentioned, um, again, talking about CPAC and its communication. I just wonder what, what kind of reach out do you have for parents who just had a child who's identified and, and getting an IEP? You know, is there a handout or anything that is given at the IEP meeting, you know, that describes CPAC and, and says So we what? have in the past actually had a handout, but the, the challenge is when you, when you walk out of that meeting, you're, especially when it's in person, you're handed a stack of papers, mm -hmm. right? And it's incredibly difficult to digest that much information, especially in a, it's, it's also generally a very high stress moment mm -hmm. for families. And that anxiety means that you can't digest half of the information that you've just been given. So even with the flyers that we have provided in the past, and the district, I actually, I, like, I, I send Allison the, the PDF and she sends it to the admin to make sure they get all photocopied out into the, the, all of the, the, the uh, mailers. Um, it, it doesn't register. The challenge is that it doesn't register. So one of the things that is part of what we're, we're, we're looking for as a CPAC to be better utilized is that I think if the district as, as a whole utilizes us as well in more committees, in more um, various workshops, then other people will see our presence. It, otherwise, we, we're sort of behind the scenes and it, it becomes very easy to, to miss us. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Sure. Yeah. Ms. Morgan, did you? Yeah, no, thank you for doing this. I had a couple of questions just about the structure of the survey because I, I, I have to know that so that I can like take all of this and turn it into something that like speaks to me. So, so the, the, the narrative, were they in response to questions about communication and transparency or were these, these were things that you, somebody elected to sort of tease out so, of a, so Yeah, so the questions page. were actually about. And she did a lot of qualitative analysis on all of our data. The, que amount. the questions were actually um, what's working well for you in the district right now and wh what, where do you see a need for improvement or have you struggled? So they were open-ended in that way. And then I went through um, and kind of did a tally of every time that, that something was mentioned and communication and transparency, those actual words <laughs> come up in, in by far the, the largest number of responses. Okay, and so are these the way that they're presented in the slides? Are, is this in sort they're of just order? pulled? They're pulled from different. No, so they're not. It, it's just it's just a, a that, that communication and transparency is the first slide. Doesn't is like then it's like okay, I see. So then this. So we've got this. I get it. I get. I get how they're grouped. So th so it was just those two open-ended questions that generated these primarily. Narrative. Yeah, and then. Um, from parents who interpreted some of the COVID questions in that way, where it was obvious that, that they were really talking about some of their other struggles, I would include, I included some of those. Okay, Yeah. Great. Yeah, no, that's helpful. I think, you know, I, I, it. So I can give you, we still have the survey, it's closed, but I can give you a copy of the survey and the questions that were. Okay, no, no, I mean, asked. I'm sure that it was like, I, I, I think that it's been like, holistically pulled together and it, it, it makes sense for Yeah, sure. this is more of a story, the, like the story from reading all 136 responses, this is the overall feeling that you get from them. Yeah, no, definitely. Okay, no, that's helpful. And, um, you know, I think we just always wanna be, um, you know, I, I just always wanna be careful when I'm reading something that's being publicly presented that I don't, 
I couldn't ever figure out who any of these kids are, mm -hmm. right? And it because it's it's a small group, and then you it I we didn't send it out over email, which I I mean, it it, it seems that that's something that that as a district we could figure out how to do for you. <laughs> I would I, I it did. oh it did it did go out over email. Did send it out in her newsletter. Okay. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, and we sent it out on our list serve. It was also on Facebook. Oh, good. And, okay. And the superintendent sent it out more than once. So like sent it out initially and said we're closing soon and sent it out it again. Oh, good. So okay. it wasn't. Uh, so this is no. So this is a pretty good sample. I think. Honestly, twenty percent of any survey is actually really great for responses. Mm -hmm. Like for I sure. Mean, I don't know how much statistical analysis people are generally doing these days, but uh, I've done a bunch of it, and and twenty percent response is fantastic. Pretty good. So, yeah. great. Just you know, uh, the other thing I forgot, Dr. Alice Nappy, was that we also do a meet and greet every year with the district. The CPAC and district uh, come together and do an in-person meet and greet, and we publish that size that as best we can as well. Uh, but again, it, that's at the very beginning of the school year in September. So in, when you're struggling in like January. Um, I just want to echo my thanks um, for all of the work that you did mm -hmm. to to put this out and analyze it and bring it back to us. Um, it's a lot of important information, and we really appreciate it. And I hope we can continue to to follow it on a re more regular basis so that we can keep working together. Great. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. All right, we're going to loop back to the AHS student representative, Amy. Hi. Hi. Welcome in person. This is exciting. Um, I guess a little update for AHS, all the spring sports. They're about in the middle of their seasons. Everyone's doing really, really well. I think spring sports are probably like our best season by far. Everyone's only lost like one game. It's crazy. Um, Overall, people have definitely been feeling that April break was very well loved and well appreciated. Everyone definitely needed it and everyone's grateful for it. Um, people are also really happy that we're finally ending school on a Friday this year. I don't know if that was your doing, but that was very well planned. I'll take it. <laughs> um, Right now, most people are thinking about the end of the year and the start of next year regarding like welcoming the freshmen to the high school and saying goodbye to the seniors. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Um, district suspensions and school discipline reports. And my understanding is that they're broken down. So if we can do one group and then we'll do some questions and then the next is that. We'll do. I think we were thinking we would do elementary, give some time for questions on elementary, do both middle schools, give some time for questions yep. on those, and then do the high school and leave time for questions on those. I do want to clarify that we're focusing on last school year's discipline data. Um, you might get some previews about what we're seeing as far as trends so far this year, and I'm sure our school leaders would be happy to answer any questions generally, um, but obviously this year's not over, so we're still compiling and gathering. Um, all of that and we'll have reports to you earlier in the school year next year is my goal um, than, than right now, but I will turn it over to Dr. McNeil who's going to be doing the elementary discipline report. Thank you. So I will start off so much. We will start off with the elementary report then we'll have our middle school principals <coughs> present and then we have Dr. Janger who is zooming in So let's make sure this works so as Dr. Holman said, the discipline report uh, is starting off from the uh, 18 or 1920 school year for the elementary. So in this, re in this particular report, uh, we'll look at the data overview, steps for that are in place for supporting behavior, um, and then all the data that we're presenting in all the reports has been disag disaggregated. Uh, based on the demographics of our students. And then I'll open it up for comments and questions at the end of the, this report. So just an uh, overview of the data without getting into all the different graphs, but um, I will go through each slide and show you what the graphs represent. But this is the overview between fe uh, September of 2019 and up to April of 2022. 
um, there's been one out of school suspension at the elementary level. And I just want to point out that during the 2021 school year, we were uh, hybrid remote. Um, so that was because of the COVID-19 um, pandemic. And I just want to highlight some of the things that are going on at the elementary level that are supporting and we're trying to be as proactive as we can. We understand that, you know, the pandemic coming out of the pandemic that has um, definitely impacted students, social emotional learning and, and their uh, mental health development. So these are some of the things that we are putting in place. Uh, we realize that um, impact on our students. Okay. That was me. Um, and so just looking at that, we are continuing to implement responsive classroom. Is that me? No. Oh. oh, okay. I will pause at this particular moment. want to go to the <clears throat> mode slideshow. Perfect. Is this going to work still? Oh, perfect. Thank you. So again, just going back to this slide, now that all of our viewers from home can see this who are zooming in. Um, so again, I'll just reiterate that we are very invested in uh, implementing the responsive classroom approach to building uh, classroom communities. We actually have training that is going to take place for our middle school educators and we have our elementary basic and advanced uh, courses that are being offered this summer. We've had a number of staff sign up for that and I want to just um, recognize Sarah Bird for being able to find grant money in order to support uh, the offering of these two courses. We have our second step curriculum that has been adopted for the explicit SEL instruction. Uh, we have three of our schools that are participating in the uh, multi-tiered systems of support academies for positive behavior intervention and support. I also want to recognize Madame Pierre Maxwell and Gibbs who are also participating in that uh, academy. Uh, we've hired an SEL coach who has been spending time within classrooms and uh, coaching uh, our teachers on how to integrate SEL strategies into their everyday instruction. We've hired full-time assistant principals at the elementary level. Thank you, school committee, for approving that. Um, and that has also been helpful with behavior management within the schools. Uh, we have the panorama student data results that we're using to actually hone in on certain areas this spring. Uh, we just had a meeting with the principals today. They're going to identify various things that they would like to focus on because they've developed action plans based upon the data they received and we're going to customize our uh, surveys to see how we are um, progressing in those areas of concern and then we also have the social social and emotional learning indicator system which is a basically like a common assessment that we've been given to students in grades 3 through 12 uh, and there is a self-assessment of how they um, are on their own perspective and how uh, on their SE, various SEL skills. So we're also going to look at that data in order to be proactive and to understand how to individually support the students in the classroom. So I'm just going to flip through the charts. As you can see, um, the, I think the, the, as you can see at the bottom, um, the zeros and you can see at the top is how the data has been disaggregated and that's for uh, 1920. As you see in 2021, we had our one out of school suspension. And then this is up to April, the data. So we have zero um, suspensions or other discipline consequences. And so I will now open it up for comments and questions. And I also wanted to uh, definitely applaud our, um, the building administrators at the elementary level and all of our teaching staff for being very proactive and just taking a 
a, a, a different approach to how we ad address discipline situations and, and trying to use it as a learning situation for the students and hone in on the skills that we need to focus on in order for them to be well adjusted to their environment. So now we'll open it up to questions. Mr. Hayner. Uh, Dr. McNeil, uh, thank you for this. This is really great. Have you had an opportunity to look back be prior to 19, 2019 to do a comparative? Uh, I think this is great where it's coming from, but. Yes, if you can remember, we did do a multi-year discipline report. Um, I'm, I'm, I, everything pre-pandemic is kind of fuzzy to me, right. but we did do a multi-year. That's why we picked it up from 1920, right. because the multi-year discipline report was up to 1819. And right. we, but we have looked back at that data. Um, and so, yes, we, do, we I, look at I it. I guess where I'm coming from is this looks really great if we had problems before and mm -hmm. things are being resolved. If, the, if we had the same results prior with no discipline problems or very few, then keep up the great work and stuff like that. So oh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Ms. Morgan. Um, so <clears throat> I guess for me, I, I appreciate that we're getting a, a report, and this is part of what we're expected to get. I Not a whole lot to, like, pull out here, right? I mean, other than, like, so I guess, you know, I'm mostly interested in slide three, four, right? The sort of behavior support piece, right? Because that's kind of where the rubber is meeting the road. If, um, and, and that's, I think, sometimes where we see the tension and where, you know, I sometimes hear from elementary teachers that, yeah, well, of course there aren't any discipline problems because we're not supposed to refer students to the office. We're not supposed mm -hmm. to ask for administrative support to help with, with behavior issues in the classroom. The expectation is that we're supposed to deal with them. Um, and so I guess I, I, don't, I don't really think this, this slide is, is the intent of the presentation today. So I don't, I don't want to get too deep into it. But I do think that, that this, is the, this is the piece that, that I want to know I want to learn more about and and how as a committee in our budgeting and policy making process we can support both administrators and teachers in this behavior management because obviously like we're we're keeping the students from being deta detained I guess you detain nine-year-olds um they're not being detained they're not being expelled they're not being suspended right so like that's good um, but, but what's happening before that, right? And, and that's, and that's, that's, I think where we, we need to learn more. And especially as we come and start to have a few consistent school years and, um, you know, we're looking at the, the PBIS and the MTSS and the elementary schools, you know, I think this is where the real conversation is. So I'm glad the slide is here. I appreciate it's not, this is a very like, like this is part of what you guys have to give us. Um, but this for me, slide four, is the, the meat of all of this, especially at the elementary level. So I appreciate it being included. I think this is the beginning of a really good conversation. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Thielman? I just, so I, for me, this report reinforces the importance of the assistant principals. Right? Mm -hmm. was, that, was that kind of like one big, that's a big message out of this, is that th that's critical for maintaining supporting behavior in the elementary schools, making sure teachers are supported, make sure <clears throat> the principal is supported. So I think it's, I just think it's something when it comes to budget time, that's what we have to be conscious of. Mm -hmm. That's my takeaway. Is that, would that be like a- I, I think that's a fair assessment. And I, I, I also want to, I, I don't necessarily think that the message to the teachers are like, they don't report discipline behavior. Yeah. I think that we do a lot of support and try to be proactive and we, a lot of teaching. And so I will say, if you walk into any elementary school, and I've been in classrooms, Dr. Holman has been in classrooms, I mean, kids are engaged in learning. And we do have behavior. Um, this is not to send a message that we don't have behavior challenges. But I do want to applaud the principals and the teachers at the elementary level for how we address those behavior challenges and not use discipline as a way to um, resolve those issues. We have social workers that are very involved. We have principals. So it's a, it's a team approach to how we address behavior. 
And so I just want to make sure that I'm emphasizing that. And, and we've known through research that suspending kids out of school and even in school suspensions, detaining them, that is not really the most proactive way of mm -hmm. resolving any type of behavior issue. And so I just want to make sure that I, and yes, assistant principals are a part of that team. Mm -hmm. And so the consultation and the things that they do with the teachers in order to support within the classroom has definitely be added to that um, number of support or that amount of support that we have at the elementary level. So I do want to, on the behalf of the elementary principals, thank you for approving that initiative. And we want to keep it in the budget. That's the idea. We don't well, want to yes. It. Yeah, that's the point I'm trying to make. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that, and I appreciate your support for yep. that. Thank you, Dr. Allison. Andy. Thank you. Um, I wanted to know if you can speak to how responsive classroom and the second second step curriculum work together. You know, what are they overlap? Are they totally separate? Well, I think things? they complement each other. I think uh, again, responsive classroom is an approach to building like different. Uh, classroom communities. I think as you get into the explicit uh, second step curriculum, we're talking about understanding and having kids understanding like this, this teaching, like the different feelings that you may have and how to address and manage your own behaviors. There's like five different competencies under Castle that we try to make sure we integrate into those lessons. And so I think those lessons are talking about language, understanding your emotions and how to respond and how to manage them. So I think that's where those uh, explicit SEL can fit into the responsive and responsive classroom can complement each other. Thank you. So, mm -hmm. All right, we can move on to. Thank you for your questions. So I'm going to turn over now. We're going to Madame Pierre Maxwell, the principal of the Gibbs, is going to do her report. And do you want? Do you want to do them both together and then have questions? Gibbs and Audison. Okay, and then Mr. Maringer, Mr. <coughs> Brian Maringer, who's principal of uh, the Audison Middle School, will do his next. So I'm going to give you the, the key. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having us, Madam Chair, Dr. Holman, everyone. Um, so I, I am happy to be back here tonight to talk a little bit about how we're doing at Gibbs this year with um, supporting our students and our approach to discipline. We are a continuation of what's happening in elementary school in regard to using responsive classroom as the core philosophy we use with our students. And uh, we all know that our students were in a very different setting the year before coming to school and they all back full time. So I think the staff, uh, the support staff, the teachers have done an excellent job using our practices that we have in place for the children. There's many of these practices they are not new to the children, but we, we taught them to them and using our core values, the three U's. Uh, we've brought on a few um, surveys that really helping us collecting data to really help us decide on how we're supporting the students. This year we, we added the uh, cell survey that um, definitely give us a, a good overview of the children's capacity when it comes to their executive functional skills. Dr. Magnil alluded to the castle competency. They are self-awareness, self-management, responsible decision-making, relationship skills, social awareness. So that CELI survey is just like you would do give an academic survey to see where the student are. This one does the same from a social-emotional aspect to really give us a sense of where are their strengths, where do we need to support them more. And the staff really has been working relentlessly on really trying to understand the students, differentiating for them. We really make great use of that advisory block in the morning to really teach them those intrinsic values and see that, that they transition throughout the school day. Uh, we added a social worker last year that has been really phenomenal, expanding the kind of support we have for the students. We met, we meet regularly using our MTSS leadership team, uh, our um, 
we meet with the teachers in learning community meetings, and then we have a social emotional wellness team, and those teams function in sync to really trying to differentiate what we're doing for the students. So for example, the MTSS team is looking more at based on the conversation that's happening in the learning community meetings, what kind of uh, capacity do we need to build for the teachers? Or what do we need to reteach for the students? When the social workers or the counselors push in, what can they support? What kind of short lesson they can do to help the students? Through a conversation, we had one, Elsie, in particular, where we saw those students had even more challenges, social emotional challenges. So we sent the entire team to receive a professional development on really understanding executive functional skills and what does that mean? How do you put that in a classroom in real life to really looking at our students who are neurodiverse? What do we do? They went, they came back, and they really made quite a few adjustments on helping those students. The wellness team is actually looking at every student by student. What's going on with that student? What intervention is in place? Is it working? What information we have from the home that can assist us on making better decisions, keeping the, the line of communication open. So these are some of the things we are doing this year to help maintaining and keeping the students in school, engaged in class, really using that logical consequences. We also use the result from the Panorama survey to really listen to our students and go back to them and give them a voice really make sure that they understand how to access the support and what does it mean uh, when you need a service. We're doing relationship mapping that's really helping us to understand, making sure every child has a caring adult they can connect with if there's something. We really want to make it three to five adults, but we know we're not there yet, so that's what we're working on, that children feel safe in the school, they feel that they have someone they can go to come to with any kind of information that may be bothering them or causing them not to be able to access learning. Uh, so last year, uh, we presented this data. We had two external suspension, one intervention, and three logical consequence slip. This is in addition to those conversation the counselors would have in small group during lunch, meeting with the students. This is when those tier one intervention have not worked, we're getting to tier two, and we really have to put something on the book because we've spoken to those students. And we also identified the uh, race of the children and, and their sex. We add that, this is the um, graph. And this is the data for this year. Um, again, last year, most of our students were also uh, a third were remote, were learning remotely, and the other two-thirds were in person in a hybrid format. So this is uh, the data for so far this school year. Um, we've had three interventions, seven logical consequences, two external suspension, and this is the breakdown of the students who have received those uh, consequences. And this is the graph. So next step, we are continuing to really looking at the resources that we have. How are we using those resources? Uh, we are still in training with PBIS. PBIS is helping us uh, having a format to collect the data and to compile it, to have a better understanding, for example, what, what time of the day, what day of the week, or what classroom were we seeing that children need more support. We are making sure that all of our staff are uh, responsive classroom train. We had quite a few new people in the building this year. They've been uh, paired with people who already understand responsive classroom. Uh, in addition to that, as Dr. Magniel um, alluded to, uh, Ms. Bird has gotten a grant where we're going to have a responsive classroom come to Gibbs to do an assessment of how well we're doing, implementing the program so we can plan for professional learning for the entire building for next school year. In addition to that, all the new staff to Gibbs will have signed up to receive the full training during the summer in the month of June, uh, just to make sure that we are all have a good understanding on how to support our students. Um, we are giving those, men the mental health screener really tried to help us identify from early in the year which students really need tier two or tier three intervention. We've done that last year, we're doing it this year. It's been very successful. Uh, I spoke about the SILIS earlier. 
uh, the sign uh, of suicide. Um, we just went to take that training, noticing that we had quite a few young of our trailblazers who were dealing with this, uh, you know, trauma base. Uh, so we are learning how to respond to it, how to notice it. Uh, we are setting to do professional development for the teachers in that next week, and then we have another group of staff who's going for the training so we can really be uh, better capacity, improve our capacity, how we noticing what the students need, and uh, also the parent panorama survey, as Dr. Magnus suggested, we are looking at what section that we want to focus on so we can continue to support the students. Just two days, we started a conversation with the fifth grade elementary school principal to create some alignment as the children transition from elementary school coming to Gibbs. They're coming from seven different schools. We will be in conversation about what can we do to make that transition a little easier on how we're collecting data from them in the spring so Gibbs can be ready to use that data in the fall to assist the students and plan for them. Uh, so we are looking at different aspects of transitioning the children for the fact that it's, it's a short year because we have to transition them again to Addison. So we are creating a bridge on both ends of the sixth grade to collaborate with elementary and uh, speaking with uh, Mr. Maringer to plan that bridge. Just today we met on our first official transition conversation on making sure that children we've worked with, we are supporting. They have a good sense of what's the support that's in place, what made it successful, if it's not quite there yet, what can they do to make sure when the children transition, they don't have to learn what we've already learned in helping them um, having access to learning. That is my presentation. If you haven't, well, we'll wait and voila. Wow. We'll go next to Mr. Manager, and then we'll open it up for questions and comments. Go forward with this one. Do you want me to? Oh. No, that was not. Perfect. So um, thank you very much for having me as well tonight. It's good to see everyone here in person. It's been a while since we've all been in the same room. I just wanted to report on the last three years of discipline. Um, I don't have an update for this year, but we're more or less on kind of the same trajectory this year that we have been in past years. So. Um, the views at the discipline at the Audison is that all students should feel physically emotionally and psychologically safe at school. Safety is what I usually tell a lot of people is my number one job is to make sure the students feel safe in school. At the Audison in middle school, we have a lot of 13 and 14 year old students who make mistakes and we want them to learn from their mistakes. We want things to be a teachable moment as best that we can. When possible, we'd like to have students take responsibility for things that they do and hopefully to fix them with uh, restorative justice when possible. And we really try to make sure that students know that they shouldn't have their education disrupted by their classmates. If you look at the data for the last three years, you will notice that students who identify as male are much more likely to be suspended or receive detention than students who identify as female. Special education students are disproportionately suspended or are issued detentions. African American students are disproportionately suspended or issued a detention. For the last three years, there was less than one detention issued per day and a majority of our suspensions are in school. Um, instead of going over all of the kind of data in the slides that I've provided, you will notice, I just wanna go over them real quickly. For example, in the year 2018 to 19, you'll notice that if you break it down by gender, 30 students were males that were suspended, um, opposed to four female. Um, IEPs, half the students who were suspended were on IEPs. One of the big things that we were really dealing with at that time was vaping. Um, it, we're seeing a lot less vaping right now in our schools. I think parents have really looked at what vaping is about nicotine and addiction, and I think they've become more vigilant, and I think we're seeing a lot less vapes right now in our schools. Um, detention data kind of tracked 
a lot with suspension data. The 2019 to 2022, once again, you'll see the disparity between males and females. You also see the high number of students who are on IEPs. Um, the biggest conflict that year we really had student conflicts. We had some physical altercations that happened at the Audison. And then for the 2020-2021 year, in which we were in hybrid for most of the year, you'll notice that we had 15 students who were suspended. Um, a lot of these students were on IEPs. Most of our students who were on IEPs during the hybrid year were actually in school four out of five days. Um, so they were a little bit more in school, and some of these students, I think, struggled with being in school during a pandemic. Um, we didn't have detention last year. Many of our kind of groupings were pretty small. Class sizes were really small. We didn't really feel that there were a lot of students that were really served by having any sort of consequences, and the students, for the most part, were extremely well-behaved. Um, looking at the combined three years, you'll notice the discrepancy in gender. 62 students were male and 10 were female. You'll notice 60% a little bit skewed by the year previous, um, but we're still over 50% of the students who are suspended are on IEPs. If you look at the racial breakdown, you notice that our white population is a little over 70% where the number of students that are being suspended are about in the mid-60s. Our African-American population is about 3.5%, and we suspended 10 students over the three years, which is about 14%. You notice the disproportionality there. Four students identified as Asian. That's 6% of the students we suspended. 11% right now is our Asian population. Five students identified as multi-race, non-Hispanic, and we had about 6%, and we suspended at about a rate of 7% of the students. There were five Hispanic students, or 7%, and our Spanish, Hispanic population was 7%. They do break out one as one ELL student as someone who was a European student. The next step and what we're trying to do is continue as an administrative team to make sure we're taking a consistent approach to discipline, continue our professional development around anti-racism and the topics of implicit bias, white privilege, and systematic racism. I think our administrative team tries to look and try to feel like, are we bringing any of the biases that we have when we're going to have certain consequences? Analyze the data to identify student needs and appropriate supports, especially when you're looking at students at IEPs, are we meeting their needs? And then just making sure that we're looking at ways to get all students feeling successful in school and have a sense of belonging. Because I think if we have students who feel successful and feel like they belong to part of the community, they're less likely to have consequences and to act. And so with that, we'll take any uh, questions. And before we move forward, I just want to add that um, part of our practice here in Arlington is like principals get a updated monthly discipline report. So we send that out to them and they, so they can analyze it, they can look at the trends, and then they sign it and they send it back to us. So we keep track of this and we, uh, of the discipline on a monthly basis. So I just want to let you know, like uh, building administrators at all levels get that monthly report. So I will now open up. I just wanted to add that. Mr. Hainer. <clears throat> this is for both of you, and I'll be asking the high school as well. Uh, bullying, uh, I didn't see that as a, it, it crosses all areas, gender, race, uh, size, physical size. Uh, is that an issue? And, and how are you dealing with that aspect of it? Currently, I'm in the process of completing two investigation with uh, alleged bullying complaint. Um, I think um, it, it took a great deal of hours to, to investigate the matter. Part of what I think we need to do is to really provide the education necessary uh, for parents to understand that 
this is the age where children are getting to know themselves. And sometimes they do misbehave, they do get mischievous. And um, a disagreement between children, it's not always a question of bullying, it's really teaching them how to be kind, how to not make comment that's not thoughtful in anger when you don't like what you're hearing. So um, I think um, when you're walking in a parent's shoes and your child is upset, it, it, it can be very difficult for you as a parent to respond to that. So uh, we don't have too much of it, but this would be the third one we are addressing. Um, the first one was not substantiated. And uh, I'm not, I haven't completed this process yet, so I can speak to where we're gonna be on it. But certainly, we also are very proactive when we have to investigate this kind of matter of putting safety measure in place and making sure that both sides get extra time with the counselors to really address whatever lagging skill that may have been absent so the children can do better. And also keeping everyone aware we don't make sure the same thing doesn't repeat. Yeah, I think we take bullying extremely seriously. We've seen, you know, what the results of bullying. Um, anytime there are any allegations made by either students or parents or teachers fill us in, we're gonna investigate that fully. Um, sometimes we find that it is bullying, most times it is not, most times it is peer conflict, but in both regards we try to bring in the students and try to be able to solve the problems to the best of our ability. We bring in the counseling staff. Um, I think the you know, counselors at the Audison do a great job of making sure that they're proactive as much as possible and find out what's happening. And for a lot of us, it's making sure that the kids feel comfortable and if we can, get them together. There are some instances in which bullying happens in which we have to separate and make different plans for kids so that we keep them safe. But it's something that we, we take very seriously and we investigate you know, as soon as we hear something. Thank you, I appreciate that. And you resolved the second question I was gonna ask, if you have reoccurrences, you, say, you stated yourself that sometimes you have to separate. When you say you separate, is it changing the schedule sometimes? It all depends. If, it, if we do have something that is bullying, then we need to protect the victim. And so it might change a schedule or it might change a classroom or a teacher that we need to separate from. And I assume you're working with the person, that, the perpetrator as well, to rectify it so it won't happen again. Yeah, we have to work obviously with both families and both, and both parties that are gonna be impacted. You know, you know, at 13 or 14 years old, um, kids are making mistakes. I think over the last few years, we're seeing increasing problems online uh, as we're seeing more things in, in the cyber world that we sometimes um, don't, get a, don't get information, in, but we talk to parents all the time that if you feel like your child is gonna be impacted educationally because of something that's happening outside of school in the cyber world, like we need to know. Are you getting support from the parents for the most part? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Good. Yeah, I would think, I mean, I think people right now, especially with the pandemic, I think you're seeing increased levels of anxiety and depression, and I think parents are very concerned of the social emotional well-being of their children, and they, they want to make sure that their kids are safe. Thank you for all your work, both of you. You're welcome. Thank you. Ms. Morgan. Um, Madame Pierre Maxwell, I, I swear I asked this same question last year when we were here. Uh, can you, interventions and logical consequence slips, right, are like new buckets. Where, where do those, is that like, are those more serious than a detention? Like I'm pretty clear on in school suspension, out of school suspension and detention. I can like, I know where things, I know how that looks, but where do interventions and logical consequences fall in that like hierarchy of severity? So it's the intervention could be a project the child has to work on. It takes a little longer. There's a lesson, there's a skill that's being taught by the social worker or with the teacher or with the assistant principal. Uh, whereas the logical consequence could be something, so for example, 
Um, can I give an example? As long as it doesn't Id identify a student, so maybe a hypothetical, something like okay, that. Okay, hypothetically. <laughs> We're all hypothetical. Hypothetically, yeah. a child may take a pencil and go and scribble on the wall, and then we speak with the parent, and the parent's like, they should clean the wall. You should give them a glove and give them a bucket, and they clean the wall. That would be a logical consequence. It, and it doesn't take time during school classes. Mm -hmm. It takes time where it's not, where you're not pulling the child out of learning to, to remove to do that. Uh, a child may have to stay after school to have a conversation with a teacher about an incident and something they have to learn because they didn't have a chance to learn it while something was happening. So it, is that one an intervention or a logical? That would be a logical consequence. I guess I'm just surprised that there's only seven of them. I, I would think that those conversations happen. Because it's not every conversation that's listed as a logical consequence. We do have a lot of conversation in between. There's tons of them. Uh, Mrs. Greiner, one of the you know, uh, advantage we have, we have an assistant principal who was the former coordinator of special education. She truly sees the children with that UDL mindset and really approach from a corrective measure, you know, listening, counseling the teachers and the students, speaking with parents, all that. We don't list all of that. We certainly have, you had a phone call home or you had a conversation with the parents and the students, but when we actually, these have not worked and we've had the conversation a few times and there's actually a deed that needs to be rectified, then the children actually has to do something outside of you had the conversation let's say you not remembering to bring your homework so you're gonna have a conversation with the teacher about okay this is three strategies you can use to remember to bring your homework or you have to write your homework on the agenda it's not necessarily a logical consequence but we're having conversation that they're not always taking place after school they are taking place in an instance during maybe an MTSS block or Mrs. Greiner would just talk to the children for a few minutes. So, um, there, so there is, is, that, is that a logical consequence or an intervention or none of the above? They all add up to, they, they all add up to getting to that place. Every time I speak to a child or Mrs. Greiner would address a child, Yes, we want it to be logical, whether it's a short minute conversation or not. But what you're asking, am I list, listing every single conversation? No, we're not. I guess I'm just confused with like the seven and the three, and it feels like very precise, but I don't understand how like this conversation and that and that plus that equals like, I, I don't, I don't, I guess I just don't, I don't know how we get to seven. Maybe they were more on the child had a specific task. Okay. to work on, on improving, not repeating the same mistake. Okay. Whereas the other one were more, okay, we had a conversation and then you went back to class or we had a phone call with your mom and your mom talked to you and we kind of monitor. It was that you didn't have to actually do a task. And an intervention is probably more extended of a project. It wasn't just a one time, you work on a long, project sometimes your parent may assist you we may have two different like we had someone who had challenges with not telling the truth so we selected a few different books that makes that point and have conversation about okay what was the story in that what did the character do how was that helpful okay so think about what happened with you what can you do differently and why is that you go think about that and then we come back yet another one to make sure that it's not a one time you're done you have a long time to really understand what was your mistake, what you need to learn to do differently, and we kind of watch over time a little bit and until it's done. And you can have more than one person working with you on that. Okay, thank you. Thank You're you welcome. very much. Dr. Allison Ampey. Thank you. Um, Mr. Marringer, I had a question for you. I'm hoping my the presentation that I've got here that has my notes is in the process of crashing, so we'll see. Um, anyway, when I was going through, first, thank you for giving us this in advance. It was really helpful. When I was going through, the thing that really stood out to me is 
how high the representation was for students on IEPs. And when I did some, when I looked up some numbers and did some math, um, when I'm calculating, and this is for 2019-2020 school year, um, that that year disabled students, as, as they are turned by the um, uh, Department of Elementary and, and Secondary Education, had a 20 times rate of suspension versus non-disabled. And this makes me feel like maybe we're doing, you know, is there something more we could be doing for these students? Is there something that we're not doing for them now that would help them with their behavior problems before they get to suspensions. And uh, so from what you said, that was a somewhat anomalous year, but the numbers are pretty high in the other years too. So it, I, I still, you know, I'm not discounting the need for the professional development around anti-racism and, and et cetera, but I'm also concerned about the specific population of students on IEPs and whether we're missing something or we're not doing something right um, or anyway I, I just and I wonder if you or the administration could speak to that thank you no I, I you know it, it pops up like obviously it's one of the things that you can see really clear that we're suspending your kids on IEPs are getting more detention. That's, it's clear, it's glaring. And, you know, we want our kids to be successful and have a sense of belonging. And so, first of all, in the academic world, we know that kids who do well usually in school are a little bit happier in school and usually are better behaved in school. And so how are we reaching these kids? So, you know, over the last couple years, we've added a bridge program, we've added a counselor, we've added a reading teacher. Um, luckily, the, we've added an LC, which has gotten classes smaller. So hopefully we're targeting the academic academic success of some of these students and realizing how we can successfully teach them so they feel like they're successful in school. So I think one is the academics and I think another sense is belonging and whether that means extracurricular activities, whether it means um, next year we're gonna look at piloting some advisory lessons so they have connections with teachers. I think the two you know, we're looking at some um, ruler as part of an SEL, and we're trying to make sure that when we go back to and you know, Madame said earlier, we want to make sure that students have a connection with an adult, and we want to make sure that they're happy coming to school and they feel successful. And I think that's really what we're working towards. And hopefully we can look in, you know, what we're doing academically. And I, I do think having the extra counselor the bridge program, we've added um, special educators to the budget, so hopefully um, class sizes are also smaller. Like I'm hoping the success a student feels just because they might learn differently will make them more enthusiastic about coming to school and also a sense of belonging and how we're reaching kids and how we're explaining to them um, the different ways that they can be successful in school. And I think those are really the two things we have to look at. But going back to your original question, if you look at it and you look at the disproportionality, it's something we have to work on. Okay. Mr. Thielen. Thanks very much for the report. I guess mm -hmm. this is a question to, to both of you. This is a report on discipline from FY19 to FY21, school year SY19 to SY21. <clears throat> and we're now in the fourth quarter of this school year, and we'll get that report sometime next year. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what, what trend you're seeing this year, because this is a year in which students are coming back to school after being out of school for a year. They're relearning in some cases how to comport themselves within a school building. My own theory about some of the turnover we've had in, in teaching is that it's been tough to teach this year because kids are getting used to being back in the building and it's 
and that's a challenge for a teacher, and there are probably days where the teacher says, I'm not going to do this anymore. I think that may be part of the, ra the rationale why we have some vacant positions. My own theory may be wrong, but that's what I think. So, I mean, could you give us a preview? Like, what do you think this report, I don't need the number. I'm not asking for the numbers, but what do you think the report's going to show us next year? <clears throat> Do you want me to go first? Sure. <laughs> That's a big question. I mean, it's, you know. Yeah, I think we are seeing um, different students this year. I, I do feel like being out of school, being in masks, I think a lot of the things that we've had to do because we've had a worldwide pandemic yeah. has affected 13 and 14 year old children. It's affected 50 year old adults. So I didn't ask your age. You know, <laughs> well, that's where I am. Um, you know, I think that's what's affecting. We're seeing, you know, if I had to describe some of the students, I would say a um, little bit more handsy. Um, I'm dealing with a lot more um, vandalism than I have in past years. Um, I've gotten uh, more complaints from the neighborhood, from neighbors in and around the school. It's really been the unstructured time. I think when the kids are in class with the teachers, they've been fairly well behaved as they're adjusting back. But I think some of the down unstructured time, I think has been a little bit more difficult. And I don't think that's something that's just in Arlington. I think that's, you know, when I talk to principals from other districts, they're having similar things, things that are happening on the weekend. And I think kids are adapting to the structure. I feel like it's better now than it was three or four months ago. If I could change, and I, if I could go back in time to September, I might have started the year a little bit differently. I think we were so happy to have the students back, and we were so concerned about the social emotional learning that we forgot some of the basic structures of talking about like, this is how you line up in a lunch line. This is how you get from class to class. I think we, not to be more structured or disciplined, but just to make sure that we were reminding them of how to do school. Mm -hmm. And I think if I could go back in time, I would, I would emphasize some of the just basic things uh, of getting to school. But, you know, for 13 and 14 year old kids who might have missed a full year of school who have been masked for two years, I think overall it's been an adjustment period mm -hmm. and I think they'll do much better coming up next year and, and the year before. But there has been an uptick, I think, in certain behaviors. Uh, I would agree to most of what uh, Mr. Merringer have shared. We are noticing a greater number of children who's dealing with suicidal ideation, which is a really young age for them to be tackling that, which is the reason why we are receiving the training to really have a better capacity on servicing them and supporting them. Uh, but we are also going to double down on our transition practices, what we do when the children come, spending longer time really teaching them how to use their executive functional skills so they can access learning, uh, spending the first two weeks of school really orientating them. We did do it, but I think we move a little too fast through it. So we're going to rethink our uh, practices, how we operate the first two weeks. We are hoping to spend some time for the staff to really connect with the children, playing with them and organizing different fun activities where they can kind of connect the seven schools together so we can assist the children better in making that transition and not just stop there but continuing being very intentional about what are we teaching them, how are we teaching it, and how are we assessing that they, they know it and, and so they can be better ready to transition. And the connection piece is huge to really making sure that um, we are making sure there's a lot of opportunities for them to have voices, to feel comfortable, to, to get to know us and to speak with us. So um, I, I, I would hope that we'll, we'll see less children who are um, trouble and feel isolated in the school because we're going to try to be even harder to give them the services. And using the data coming from fifth grade to, to get a head start and not just wait till what we're collecting in the fall, but how they leaving the seven schools, collecting some of that data to start planning ahead. Good, yeah, and the other thing, I thank you very much, that, that helps. The, um, I appreciate the honesty and the candor. 
The other thing I, I, you know, I do, I like the fact that our district is focusing on trying to do in-school suspensions. Mm -hmm. As someone who experienced that, as a parent, I think it's a good thing. So mm -hmm. I think, uh, yeah. So I, I, I do appreciate that, and I'm, and I'm grateful that that's that's mostly our focus. Yeah, I mean, I think we realize kids are going to make mistakes. Yeah. And so we need them to learn from it, and it's much better if they're still in the school learning and around adults. They can see counselors during the day. Yeah. It makes a, it makes a lot more sense. Yeah, I think the parent community is yeah. grateful for that. I just want to add to what Mr. Merringer said. I think the word you used was handsy, um, that we've seen some other interesting data trends in the district, too, that aren't necessarily disciplined, but we've had more injuries, uh, particularly during unstructured time than is typical, uh, particularly at the beginning of the year. Lots of broken bones, there were accidents, we assessed playgrounds for safety, but often during some of these unstructured times. We've had um, total accidents happen, uh, but that are sort of the reflection of students just sort of getting used to having their bodies in school all day. Mm -hmm. uh, and some exhaustion that came with that because the um, need to sort of persevere through an entire day and have the attention span for that would often get sort of, um, it would come out at recess and they would need to be moving around a little bit more. So that was one thing that has, that really peaked in the fall and has leveled off. I would say discipline was also heavier than anybody expected it to be in the fall uh, and has improved over the course of the year at the district level as trends. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, Mr. Thielman basically went in the direction I wanted to, to go because I was concerned too about, particularly at the Gibbs, because they're moving into a new and unique situation with an expanded cohort after being out of school largely the prior year. So that's a huge adjustment. And so I, I'm wondering if in particular there's something you learned this year about acculturating your rising uh, fifth graders, or you know, fifth graders moving into sixth grade at the Gibbs, and the sixth to seven, that the building transition to the Odyssey this year that was sort of different than the past, and that you might be looking to change as you're meeting the needs of the, this year's cohort moving up. It's only been year number two, mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Uh, but w we did notice having the children coming into the building, being virtual and doing hybrid, mm -hmm. it wasn't having them the entire day mm -hmm. all year long. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think uh, hence maybe the reason why we didn't spend as much time we should have on transitioning them and mm -hmm. re teaching and reteaching those skills mm -hmm. and taking longer time. Mm -hmm. we, we recognize and realize uh, our school centered around social emotional learning and transition, mm -hmm. it's really important that this takes a priority mm -hmm. and that we pace ourselves. I, I don't think the teachers are not quite comfortable. We want to start learning mm -hmm. in the subject as soon as we enter, but we also understand the benefits and the teachers do realize that. Mm -hmm. The benefit we get from really taking time to teach the routine, the procedures, the expectation, and giving them time to learn them. Because as soon as we hit January, the children not only developmentally are shifting in their body, they also have to be ready to transition to OMS. And there, there are expectations that there are some things they would be able to do better mm -hmm. from when they left elementary going into middle school. Mm -hmm. So we're really working on an unintentional way of transitioning them. And part of that at the beginning is also the connection piece, mm -hmm. the connecting adult piece. We, we working as a whole staff, we're doing a book study right now on this book is anti-racist. And a big part of it is about identity. It's about connecting with the children. So uh, for the last three months and until the end of the school year, the staff has been being facilitating in doing the book study themselves. So then we can understand how to roll it out with the children and we're hoping to also connecting with parents over the summer so they can be privy to mm -hmm. what we're doing, what we're planning to do, and get the cooperation, another area to connect with the children, mm -hmm. and hopefully hope, helping them to, to access learning uh, much better and being happier being in school. 
I think one of the first aha moments I had in September was I was talking to one of the seventh graders and I was like, well, at Gibbs, how did you do this? And the, and the student looked at me and was like, I didn't go to Gibbs. I was remote the whole year. I never stepped in there. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So we have literally <laughs> gone from an elementary structure up to the Audison and we have taken for granted that there is this transitional school that we had that w was introduced to LCs and mm -hmm. a lot of kind of the kind of middle school. And for some of our students, we didn't have it. We did talk today about transitioning today in terms of myself, an administrator, counselors going down to talk to students at the Gibbs later this month and then them being in the school. And I think we want to get back to making sure that kids are being able to come to the school, see the school, feel familiarity. And, um, you know, I, I think we're looking forward to, to next year a lot in terms of seeing how kids have kind of recalibrated. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think one of the things that, unfortunately, you know, when Madame came aboard and I've, you know, I've been here four years. I mean, if we've been here six years, most of it's been during a pandemic mm -hmm. and we're looking to try to merge a lot of things that the mm -hmm. schools are doing successfully when we're not kind of in reacting to a pandemic mode. Yeah. And I think getting the time, especially the summer, mm -hmm. to try to look at some of the things that we both can learn from each other will mm -hmm. be really beneficial. Thank you. Thank you. I just, um, I also wanted to mention the <clears throat> disproportionality of the special education um, discipline at at OMS. And uh, Dr. Allison Ampey asked, you know, made a lot of comments that I was thinking and asked the question. But I appreciate you sharing some of the things that have been put in place, um, and if there are other things, you know, moving forward that that OMS needs to support that. Um, I hope you'll keep us informed because it's that's it's a big uh a big difference uh with those that number okay thank you yes thank you uh school committee for members for your questions and uh, now we're going to move on to uh, dr janger and the high school report okay and dr janger i will be the one clicking so if you just let me know when to click the slide uh, but i'm going to turn it over to you at this point is he muted? Yeah, you're muted right now if you're trying to talk. It takes me a second to find the clicker. Yeah, got you. Um, so anyway, thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. So thank you very much um, for this opportunity. Um, and um, so today I'm primarily talking about discipline and discipline data. Um, and a lot of this data and a lot of the, the more interesting data you've already seen. I went back to 29th, the school, 2018 school year. So we had a three, the three year trend before the uh, pandemic. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about last year. And then I have a little bit of information about um, what we're seeing this year. Um, but I think one of the things that's been clear in all of the conversations we've heard is that when we're talking about uh, discipline data, we, one of the really positive things in all of the schools in Arlington is that we very rapidly switch over into our systems of social emotional support. Um, and that's because as a district, we've really shifted away from uh, the punitive approach to discipline. But when we're looking at this discipline data, um, in this case, suspension data, um, we're looking at two things. We're looking at what kind of student behavior warranted the disciplinary response and then what was the response that the uh, staff undertook and then we're looking to see both that that behavior gets better we're looking to make sure that our practices are equitable with different student populations and we're looking to make sure that we're using effective staff interventions um, and so we want to look at the differences one of the things we're looking at is do we have different responses for different plus populations, but also whether or not our responses have been effective for the different behavior. So when we're looking here at um, out of school suspension and in school suspension, for the most part, we have eliminated the use of suspension, separating schools from students from class um, for anything but relatively serious infractions. 
So we're talking about substances in school, fighting, theft, um, or um, potentially criminal behavior outside of school um, are things that result in separating students from school. And one of our biggest strategies for addressing behavior overall has been collaborative problem solving. And I've talked to you a lot about that. So I'll, I'll only touch on it briefly here. We've also done a lot of work on anti-bias and equity training. We've been reviewing our support programs. We've been doing curriculum review to make sure that our curriculum represents our students and therefore they're more engaged and reflected in their class and a wide range of climate and culture efforts with student clubs, activities, um, advisories, all those sorts of activities that we've been doing. And so at the heart of our disciplinary philosophy is this idea that student behavior, the challenging behavior is primarily an issue of skill, not will. The kids succeed if they can. And so that rather than focusing on making students want to behave, we really want to focus on what is the underlying reason for the challenging behavior um, and then work with the student through the collaborative problem solving process to develop those skills. And we recognize that problems are solved in an interaction between the situation and the student and that we often are the ones that control that situation. And we are, um, as we'll, you'll see in the trends, seeing consistent reductions in challenging behavior. You can go to the next slide. And this slide is really nice because even though we lost the last uh, bit of 2020, what this shows is month to month patterns and it shows it across all discipline, but you'll see that in out of school suspensions as well as detentions and, inter and in school suspensions. And you can see that over the three years prior to the pandemic, we saw consistent um, reductions across the board. But one of the things you'll notice when we get to the data at the end of the presentation that I presented before, we still have these issues of disproportionality. The nice thing is that by the end of 2020, um, we were down to 19 suspensions out of school. And so when you're talking about disproportionality, we're talking about anything more than one African-American student, anything more than three students um, in special education would be disproportional. And so the numbers really then come down to stories that are a lot more close to the ground and honestly, sometimes difficult to discuss in this context, if we're talking about one or two incidents and why a student um, and how we understand what happened with that student. But what we look for, and one of the things I've talked about before are is issues of the suspensions around um, events that are either the result of our interpretation of behavior or the result of interactions between students and teachers. And in both cases, those have fallen almost to zero. And that's one of the things that we're most excited about. Next slide. <clears throat> so 2020-21, Arlington High School was predominantly remote last year. We were only back in school for about a month at the end of the year. Um, we had about a 200 students a day in the school, special education students and general education students in our Millbrook workplace and then the in-person academy that we created were in school every day um, or four days a week. Um, but um, one of the other things that happened, because it wasn't that we had no challenging behavior, there was out of school behavior that affected students. Um, there were students who were in the school, but the incidents, so there were fewer incidents of in-school behavior. There was only that one suspension. We did not use detention um, either, but there were also different options for intervention with an empty building. Often what we could do when students were experiencing challenging behavior was actually give them more interaction and more supervision during the school day in school, rather than needing to separate them from education or have them after school. So a lot of our efforts on challenging behavior last year, and this now fortunately feels very far in the rear view mirror, was around attendance and engagement. So last year, if you, you may recall, we actually had real-time monitoring of attendance. So our attendance office was actually checking in with teachers 15 minutes after classes started and beginning to contact students to get them engaged in classes. And that was really important to keeping kids engaged through all of the difficult disruptions of the last year. And then there was a lot of emphasis on staff follow-up to make sure that if students were falling behind then 
um, papers that they could follow up if they weren't doing their work, if they were disengaged, that they were looping back around to contact those students, either the teachers were, or they were reaching out to the deans or counseling staff. Um, and so that was reflected, at least in the level where we were able to track it, in the deans actually logging almost 5,000 student contacts. So when they were reaching out to students to reiterate expectations, to re-engage them, um, they were logging that. And in a little over a thousand of those cases, they logged that they were having a CPS con con conversation. So what does that mean? They would initiate those contacts, reiterate expectations. Part of the approach with collaborative problem solving is to not be punitive in the conversation, but trying to identify with the student what's going on. Why are you having difficulty meeting that expectation? And then often it was a, what's called a spontaneous plan B. Teachers were trained in that. The deans were trained in that where you start that small conversation to try to focus in on drilling down on what is the challenge for the student and how can you come up with a solution so they can meet the expectation. And then proactive plan B, where we sit down, we do a form, we plan ahead. Um, that happened in approximately 50 situations that were logged by the deans, although I think there were many more that didn't make it into our records. And then in addition, there were a whole lot of layers of behavioral support. One of the major ones was the COVID-19 mental health screener, which we conducted in January. Next slide. So I know folks are interested in this year. Um, and this year's behavior is, um, as the other teachers have, um, the, the other folks have explained, it's a little hard to map on. We're very much in the middle of it. I was pleasantly surprised, to be honest, when I went through the data to date because I know how hard folks are working on adjusting to coming back to school. Um, adjusting to school post pandemic, everyone has seen this. We have sophomores who've really never, barely been in high school, freshmen who've never been in high school and didn't have much of an eighth grade or had a really disrupted eighth grade experience. And we have juniors whose last memory of being in school um, was their freshman year and seniors as well. And so one of the things that we've discovered is not only that the students didn't sort of understand things, but that a lot of our relationships that would help us to know who we were reaching out to or the students to understand what our expectations were, were not there. You know, we don't have freshmen who have seen seniors and how the students behave in the school. And so in many ways, this year has felt like rebuilding the whole school culture and set of relationships from scratch. So. As I said, we've had 10 out of school suspensions to date, um, substances in school, some out of school behaviors, some behaviors that actually occurred before students arrived in school, um, and some students who are new to Arlington. We've had nine in school suspensions, um, and that's really been something we've been trying to do more of. Um, and I'll talk about that at the end, ways in which we've been trying to shift with some of our most common suspensions, which are um, around, uh, substance abuse to a more um, a more intervention approach, a more treatment approach. So we had a lot of suspensions in September, October. That was that adjustment to period. And this would be um, wonderful if we continued at this rate through the year, but most likely given past experience, we will double these numbers between now and the end of the year. Next slide. So this is just a quick reminder of sort of what CPS focuses on and we can come back if you'd like a larger presentation at some point I would love to come back in the fall and talk about how we're rolling that out in the future but the idea is that plan a right disciplinary consequences do this or else is helpful in making it clear to people that the rule is a rule um, and that you want them to meet expectations but it also tends to dysregulate students and break conversations, break relationships, and doesn't build skills. Plan C, which is to reduce the expectation to not hold students accountable for some behavior, is useful and is something that we engage in sometimes when we don't feel that a student is able to meet an expectation and that the expectation is not so important that it disrupts other people's experiences or the student's ability to be safely in school. But plan B, is an effort to work collaboratively with a student to find a lasting solution that meets both our expectations and their needs. And in that case, it reduces the challenging behavior, meaning we don't have the disruptions, we don't have the escalation 
the behaviors that lead to suspension. It builds skills, it solves the problem, and it builds that helping relationship. Now, sometimes in the initial cycles of plan B, um, what it does is it builds the helping relationship and it reduces the challenging behavior and builds skills. Sometimes it takes a few rounds for the problem to be solved. Next uh, slide. So in 2020-21, it was challenging during the um, pandemic year, we had a leadership consultation team meeting uh, two times a month. That was a small group meeting for coaching and review of practices. And that was to develop leadership in teaching and leadership in folks that work with the teachers. We had coaching support for teachers in conducting Plan B conversations. So sometimes when teachers were finding challenging students, we would meet with them and coach them in the process or they would work with folks from Think Kids. We had staff training on applying CPS Dr. to COVID Tanner. challenges. Yep. Um, just looking at the time, can we focus on the, the discipline piece of this? Um, Absolutely. For this evening, thank you. Sure. Next slide. So I'll skip over that because that wasn't what you wanted to hear. So this data, if I go through it, is actually data that you've seen before. So I don't really need to discuss it in great um, in great detail. Out of school suspensions, as you've seen, have dropped over the three year period prior to the pandemic. We had only one last year. Next slide. Um, you can go quickly through those to the next one. Next slide. Next slide. So that's just a visualization of the disproportionality. But what you'll see here is out of school suspensions. So dating back to 2018, we had a very high proportion of our suspensions were African American students which led to a disproportionality of six times. And we saw some of the other patterns that Dr. Brian Maringer explained in terms of higher rates for boys um, and higher rates in special education. Um, next slide. So you can see as you go, go forward, the disproportionality continues, although it gets significantly better, but also as the numbers drop, the overall numbers drop substantially. Next slide. So by the time you get to the year prior to the pandemic, while we have a disproportionality of five times, that's actually four incidents and actually it was only three students. Next slide. In-school suspensions were a little bit more complicated because there was an increased use of in-school suspensions for some kinds of behavior in the past we would have um, potentially had an out-of-school suspension for. So it stayed a little bit more flat overall. Next slide. And again, going through those next two slides, you can visualize the disproportionality and you can see here, there was a disproportionality again, but a little bit less so. In this case, it was Hispanic. The numbers are relatively small, 19. You can go to the next slide. Um, again, you can see as the numbers dropped a little bit, the disproportionality is still there, but the numbers overall are small. And then 20, 19, 20. Um, and so you again can see that shift as we get a little bit smaller. Next slide. So I didn't talk in this, um, we, we had a large presentation about um, detentions. Those were pretty complicated to interpret. I didn't include that here um, because that was a much larger conversation and is not as reliable a set of information. But the things that we want to make, as I said, we want to keep track of are discipline based on the attribution and relationships. Discipline based on student teacher interaction, and those have dropped almost to zero. Next slide. And things that we're looking at is continuing our CPS training, continuing ongoing training on equity and unconscious bias. We've done a lot of work in terms of student culture. The anti racism working group is really sort of a touch phrase for all of our work with affinity and anti bias groups in the school. Um, We've been reviewing our interventions, and that's something I talked about a little bit, having more of a treatment model for drug offenses. That doesn't always mean that there isn't an out-of-school suspension, because if someone, is, um, if someone is under the influence of substances in school, we end up having to send them home, although we may be able to shift that to being a medical withdrawal and then shift to the intervention for the students. And then one of the things we've been focusing on a lot this year has been the issue of truancy. And so we're looking at an academic support model for that, for those absences, rather than a disciplinary model. Um, one of the things you should also be aware of is that going forward, we're looking at um, a card-based system, which will help us with attendance tracking and should help us a little bit more with control going in and out of the building. Next slide. 
Is that that's the last one? Yeah, that's it. That's all we have. Did you have another slide that we're missing? No, 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 I couldn't remember. Okay, so now I'm going to, uh, so you're done with your presentation. We can open it up for questions and comments, okay? Yeah. And I can go back over the, um, the, the discipline data, but that is actually all data we've reviewed in the past, which is why I didn't want to spend a lot of time on that. Okay, thank you. Mr. Hainer. Does the open campus uh, have any uh, reflection on the discipline issues that you've seen? So I will say open campus is a necessary situation in the current building because in terms of where students can be, I think that if we had students in the building, one of the challenges prior to open campus in the building, which would be a very significant challenge now, is that students end up finding themselves hanging out in corners and places where they're not supposed to be. And that leads horsing around, horseplay, um, kids hanging out to lead to negative interactions with staff and negative interactions with other students. So I think that in that way, collabor um, the open campus is really assisting us in giving students an ability to take a break from school. Open campus is challenging. It's not really open campus, actually. What is challenging this year is that with the high rates of absence, right, anytime um, a teacher's kid gets COVID or they get COVID, um, they're out. Um, it's been harder to find subs. We haven't had paraprofessionals um, to sub in classes. So there are higher levels of kids than what we would have been Old Hall. Um, but having them crammed into Old Hall would, I think, have been a disciplinary challenge. And I think right now the kids actually, for the most part, make really positive use of that time to go out, take a break, and come back into the school. Or they find places in the school, and what we see is the kids are pretty um, constructively studying. And we're really excited that a year from now, when we have the central commons, where there will be a lot more common spaces and a lot more places for students to work constructively during the school day if they're not in class. I guess uh, my question, when I see students over at the CVS, when I see students down at the bagel shop, when I see students a couple of blocks to the, the other direction up Mass Ave on both sides of the street, I'm concerned about our uh, responsibility for them and what they may or may not be doing. So I'm, that's a comment. I'm not looking for any reaction to that at this time. Thank you. Okay. In the interest yeah. of time, Go ahead. Yeah. All right, Mr. Hainer, you're, you're okay. All right. Thank anybody you. else want to say something? Questions? Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, thank you for this, Mr. Janger. Um, Dr. Changer, sorry. Um, you mentioned having IEP data in terms of suspensions and, and stuff, but it wasn't included in ours. And I'm just wondering, again, this is partly for the administration, whether this is something that we want to be looking at. I mean, that school committee wants to have presented to them. And I personally would vote yes because I was really impressed by what we saw in the Audison data. Yes, yes. Uh, as we look at our discipline data, we will make sure that we update our reports to include you know, special education status, but we do want to disaggregate it, including all those different type of identifiers. So yeah. thank you for that, and we will make sure that we are, as we move forward, we'll, we'll conclude that in our reports. Great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Ms. Morgan. Yeah, just some consistency across levels of yes. what we're seeing. This is, um, I appreciate this is a lot of work and mm -hmm. <coughs> there's, um, last year's data is real weird and mm -hmm. it's, so it, it feels to me like this is a report that we want to get in October for the year in arrears, but, but to see something similar, presented similarly across Yes. Levels and mm -hmm. schools would be more um, yes. actionable and for us, I think. So. Yes, we will take that feedback and, and, and implement it. Mr. Schleifman? Yeah, I, I, I've had a hypothesis for the past few years after looking at the data uh, that the high school and maybe elsewhere in the district has different issues with students who are relatively new to the district versus students who have uh, uh, an extended time in the district. So for example, a child who 
has been in our elementary schools, has moved up through the Gibbs Odyssey, well, the Gibbs wasn't there before, moved up through the Odyssey into the high school. Uh, hypothetically, I, I'm running off the theory that those students are having an easier time with it at the high school and are less likely to encounter neg uh, negative issues at the high school, be it uh, academic or uh, in terms of behavior. Uh, as compared to kids who are transferring into the high school in the middle of their high school career. So the reason why I'm asking is I'm sort of thinking that we may need to look at ways we can acculturate and, ser uh, and serve kids to bring them into the community and make them feel a part of it as well. So I, I'm, I'm just sort of curious in going through the report that you keep your eye out for that and if you start to see something that looks like a, a, a differentiation between longstanding Arlington students and, mm -hmm. and kids who transfer, uh, I, I think that maybe there would be programs we'd be looking to do to, to meet that need. Yeah, well, we can take that in consideration. Thank you. Anybody else? So can I take a moment just to thank uh, Madame Pierre Maxwell, Mr. Maringer, Dr. Janger, and our, also our elementary principals for um, putting together these reports. And uh, hopefully you were able to, you know, get some, it was giving you some valuable information and see some trends and how we're moving forward. We understand that behavior challenges are a part of, you know, schooling and we are going to continue to try to make sure that we're being proactive in our approaches and how we address those uh, challenges. So hopefully saw some trends uh, throughout the elementary and middle and the high school levels. Thank you. Mr. Hainer. I'd like to also thank Dr. McNeil and Dr. Holman for putting this all together. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Sure thing. Thank you. Credit goes to Dr. McNeil on that one. He did all the work on this. <laughs> um, thank you, Dr. Jenker. Thank you. And Dr. Holman, I don't know if you want to this. Yes. <laughs> Have a good night, folks. <laughs> good. Okay, they're going to go. All right. Um, monthly financial report, Mr. Mason. Good evening, school committee members. Um, tonight you'll have... Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. Tonight you have the monthly financial reports for the district uh, uh, for the finances as of uh, April 25th. Um, and included in the reports is the normal uh, reports that you would normally see for the town appropriation, which we also call as the general fund, uh, special revenue and revolving, and the grants. Um, so we'll start with the general fund. And uh, the, the general fund, uh, currently this month, we're or at, as of April 25th, we're at about $56.6 .6 million dollars uh, expended, um, which is about $10 million higher than where we were the, from the last report. Um, and we are around $23 million encumbered between salaries and our, you know, vendors that we uh, provide, that provide services and goods to us. And what you'll see is under projected expenditures is a net of pr projected expenditures and uh, expense transfers which actually led to uh, a net credit or reduction to expenditures on the general fund, which left, leaves us with an a, a remaining balance of about $600,000. Now, what you'll notice in this report, normally there's a lot more projected expenditures. As we're in April, we're coming to start our close of the year. So um, we're, the department budgets are now being held on hold. And so we're not projecting uh, complete spending of the remaining of their, their balances. Um, many of their balances are depleted at this point as well. So those that did have minimal amounts are, are being held at this point. Um, and I need no other notes that I'm missing. And as I was noticing today, uh, as we're doing some of the closeout cleanup, we're noticing that there are some encumbrances that actually are no longer needed uh, and departments are actually requesting to close some of them. So the remaining balance can move either way. This number is still sort of fluid, so I wouldn't bank on it 100% at this moment. 
Um, this slide I discussed with you last time, there's not much differences uh, in terms of what the driving factors, whether um, between the salary savings and uh, the out-of-district tuition and transportation, as well as expenditures that have been, you know, uh, that has hit us. Um, it may, may not probably be reflected on the report, which are tied to the ventilation costs and medical supplies for COVID-19. Um, also, which added, though, to this is we did make uh, premium payments um, to, to our staff, um, and that is reflected as a pending expenditure um, on, on this report, but it will be posted as, a, uh, as an expenditure for next period. Um, and this is an acknowledgement of staff that uh, for the, inst the instructional related work due to the transition of COVID that the ARPA funds did not acknowledge um, due to the regulations tied to ARPA funding. The next is uh, what I want to talk about is the special revenue and revolving. Um, and so overall, uh, we're projecting a $4.4 million balance by the end of the year for these funds. Uh, we collected and spent about the same amount, $2.9 million. The revenue is a big, is a, a large uptick from last month tied to a third quarter payment to Circuit Breaker. Um, we do have a large amount of projected expenditures that are going to be higher than with what we do project remaining in revenue. Uh, the projected expenditures are tied to projects that are going to be listed on the next slide. Um, and the projected revenue is a third quarter payment, I mean a fourth quarter payment to Circuit Breaker, and as well as collection of rent from our after school vendors in community education. Here are some of the projects that I did outline, I did speak about last, last time. And those projects are still remaining uh, as, as initiatives that we're going to be doing um, starting likely in May. And this, the, the final uh, slide is the overview of the grants. And um, at this point, we have about $5.4 million awarded. $2 million of that is COVID-related grants. And uh, as designed, those funds were going to be used over multiple years. Um, we're projecting to carry about 1.7 million over uh, over the next two years to help cover any initiatives that we already proposed to the school committee um, and as well as any other buffers that are needed in the out years. Now I can open up to any questions. Mr. Cardin. Uh, just a quick comment that we, we need to discuss the prepayment issue. We, we had pledged to the finance committee that we would discuss that with them. So. Anybody else? Okay, go ahead, Dr. Alcidemi. I just wanted to ask a question publicly about the maintenance salaries where it shows that we have a remaining balance of 200,000, over 200,000, and just ask, does this mean that we aren't getting maintenance done or, or where, um, what, what's happening with that? So we have several vacancies in the facilities department, uh, specifically on the maintenance team. Um, those positions have been hard to fill due to the salary schedules that are in place. Um, we have tried to make adjustments uh, with working with the town um, who manages those unions. Um, we haven't been able to fill many of those positions even after those adjustments. Um, so obviously, it's also a hot construction market, so it's hard to compete with the private construction agencies that are around the area, including the one that we're building here in Arlington. Um, so what I will say is that we had a, uh, many of our, our we had two uh, HVAC technicians. Uh, one was here in the beginning of the year who then left for a, a teaching position. And um, we instead are using contracted services. And so what you'll see is, what, you, what you'll see is that those, those costs are higher than prior years. Um, what you won't see is that it's not reflecting a deficit um, because there are proposed transfers reflected in the revised budget amounts. And um, the work we're getting done with the lack, those vacancies, um, besides there's a, there's a handyman and there's another position that I just can't recall at the moment, but um, those, those four positions, we are able to still get work done in the district, but we're getting work done that is we're deeming necessary and to make sure the buildings are safe and be able to be occupied. Okay. Thank you. Okay. 
Thank you, thank you, Mr. Mason. And the superintendent's report, Dr. Homan. Okay. Let me pull up my slides. Okay. Start with the regular um, numbers for COVID cases in the district. Um, we are tracking right along with some of the N NWRA data, we saw a pretty significant uptick um, in cases that sort of came in after the break uh, that uh, was happening over the past couple of weeks, but that has begun to decline this week. We keep a close eye on things. We've really enjoyed being able to open up some windows at some of our schools this week because the weather's been a little warmer, go outside for lunches or for recess, um, and that should continue to have a positive impact. We did rounds of pool testing and have had some positive pools come back. I think we've had um, uh, it was close to 20, but I would have to go back and look. Uh, positive pools come in this week. We're able to isolate those cases. Um, overall, things are going okay, but we did have a little bit of staffing challenge this week because we had a number of staff who were out taking care of children who had gotten sick over break or who were out themselves. Um, so, but we are starting to see um, that level off a bit and hopefully begin to decline as the weather gets warmer. Uh, I want to give a strategic planning update, and you have a number of documents available to you in, um, in Novus that are coming from the strategic planning team. We had our first meeting on the 12th of April. It was a virtual launch. Um, folks shared in some small groups their hopes and dreams for the school system and also for the process itself of developing a mission, vision, and overarching strategic priorities for the district. You have a copy of the notes document that came from that that's quite lengthy um, in your materials if you're curious or would like to review it. And then from there, they, um, we had our first in-person meeting on the 26th. We did three rounds of data analysis at that first meeting that was just on Tuesday. There's a picture there um, of the team doing a little bit of a warm-up activity that was quite fun. They first took a look at um, data sources that they had analyzed or chosen to analyze that we had dropped into a, a resource folder of artifacts uh, in groups that had, of people who had looked at the same artifact and then they divided up into groups that had looked at different artifacts and tried to build conclusions from that. The agenda from Tuesday's meeting is available to you and I'll share some additional resources from what folks generated during that second meeting the next time we meet. Our next meeting is on the 9th of May and at that point we'll be analyzing mission and vision statements from various organizations and talking about how values are reflected in mission, vision and mission statements as well as the values that um, Arlington holds dear and would like to see reflected in a vision or mission statement that we might have. Um, so we've gotten off to a great start. We're having fun. Um, it's a big group and it's very organized. Our facilitators have done a spectacular job keeping documents um, pretty organized and keeping us pretty organized and also on task. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the next several meetings. We have five meetings left um, and I'll keep everybody posted. We should have a draft towards the end of May that the school committee can look at before you're brought sort of a more official first read, second read, and we can have more discussion about what the team has been generating. A few other updates. I want to acknowledge um, Hannah Markeltz and Andrew Yang who are the um, SILS awardees, this is a Middlesex League award, and I can't, I don't have my notes in front of me that tells me what that acronym means, and I don't have it memorized. Uh, but this is an award that's given by the Middlesex League um, annually, and it recognizes students for their exceptional leadership skills, for academic achievements, um, and we're very proud of these two students for earning this award. I want to thank our excellent administrative assistants because it was Administrative Assistance Day this week and there were a lot of celebrations going on throughout the district to say thank you to our fantastic um, assistants all over the district, including Ms. Diggins. Thank you. Um, we have some upcoming lab events to celebrate that I wanted to share with the committee. Uh, Special Olympics is Monday, May 16th. Um, at Lexington High School. This is a great event. Uh, if you wanted to stop by and cheer on students, uh, feel free to do so. I believe the festivities get started at 9 o'clock. Um, I can double check that if you're interested in going and I'll send you the details. The graduation is, um, they have two. Monday, June 13th, um, 2022 is the middle school graduation and Thursday, June 9th, 2022 at the high school which actually conflicts with one of our school committee meetings. Um, but so I'm we're not going to be able to attend that high school one. But if you have any interest in look, uh, attending the middle school one, let me know. Um, I'm hoping to make it down there for that. Administrative hiring searches that are going on right now, the bracket assistant principal position is either about to be posted or posted today, posted today. 
Um, high school uh, special education coordinator position is posted. Uh, director of social studies K-12 has been posted. Uh, Dr. McNeil has taken the lead with Mr. Spiegel on the uh, searches for director of visual arts K-12 first round interviews for that took place this yeah, week. The other way around. Flip it the other way. Mm -hmm. Director of health and wellness took place earlier this week. Yeah. Director of visual arts K-12 is happening on May 9th. I have my dates backwards on those two <laughs> searches. Um, so I can fix that. Uh, and then also your enrollment reports are in your folder, and I'll take any questions that you have. Mr. Schlickman? So we're moving our graduation to a Thursday? No, 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 this is the lab. Oh, oh the lab graduate. Yeah, oh, yeah the I, lab collaborative graduation. Oh, okay. <laughs> we're okay. not moving ours. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, whoa, what? Yeah. Ms. Morgan. Um, I had a question about the, the mission and vision work um, and the, the the goals, uh, it's been brought to my attention that I was elected chair of the CIA committee last um, two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, really, it's an unanimous vote. Yeah, I'm psyched <laughs> about that. So, um, typically, I, I've actually been the subcommittee chair before of that group, and typically, what we have done in the spring is we have taken the uh, district goals and we have worked on the sub goals, and there's been understandable. Um, pressure to do so so that we could get those goals to teachers before they left for break so they could do their work. So am I right in that we, you've decided we don't have those goals? Are, like, are those a thing? Are they not a thing? I'm confused trying to do like the minimum I need to do, but that we all understand like where we're going. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, one of the things that's on my list to do is to reach out to you so that we can get a meeting together of CIAA so that we can talk about this exact thing because it, it is a little awkward in that this group is working on this at the same time as we should also be thinking about what our plans and major initiatives are for next year. And it's not as though the district doesn't have things going on that we know we're going to continue working on next year. So what Dr. McNeil is going to work on with the curriculum team, um, we're at a conference next week, but upon our return is getting together an initiative preview which is sort of like the goals that you've reviewed in the past that will give sort of an overview of in the different disciplinary areas here and at the different levels here are the things we know we'll be working on next year um, we'll we can align those to the current overarching priorities because they will align well to the existing overarching priorities and that would be the version of what you all have looked at as district goals for this year um, so long as this approach works for the committee and CIAA agrees with this approach and then we could bring that initiative preview alongside whatever this the drafts of the mission and vision statement are to the full committee for review or we could go through CIAA for a first round look at the drafts um, I'm open to different iterations of that, but that's sort of how we were thinking about it. Because okay, so we're gonna we're keeping the overarching goals in some format for FY23. Yes, or because the strategic plan. So the strategic plan itself, with benchmarks and outcomes and all of the details of it, it won't be totally done and ready to launch until an implementation date that we had projected of January of 2023. So we're going to stick with mission and vision as stated and overarching priorities as stated for next school year. Okay. Um, and then that'll sort of switch over mid next school year. We'll have those big priorities. But we should know pieces of it before the end of this school year. It just makes the most sense for us to stick with what we have for right now for next school year's planning. Okay. All right. Sounds good. I just want to make sure we've, we uh, have, have not met our obligations to our staff in the past. And uh, I, I, I believe we didn't actually the year that I was chair of CIA. So I want to make sure that we don't do that again. It's what? You're all set? Yeah. Okay. You're all set. Um, okay. Uh, school committee representative for 2025 Patriots Day Celebration Committee. So, um, select board member John Hurd reached out to Mr. Hainer and I um, about a committee that the select board has decided um, will exist to plan for the semi-quincentennial uh, Patriots Day celebration. <laughs> And I've been practicing saying that. Good. <laughs> Better be than me. Uh, so we, um, the details about the plans are in 
Novus, and I know you all read it really carefully yes, to did. know the details, but we need to select a representative for this committee. Just, <laughs> Mr. Cardin. Just to clarify, it's a, a representative or a designee, right? So it doesn't have to be a member of our board. Okay. It may, it may actually be more appropriate to look for a social studies teacher or, or someone okay. else who might be more interested in um, the 250th anniversary of Arlington, of monotony. So it sounds like we should have the community relations subcommittee. <laughs> mm -hmm. Find Before someone. Yeah, it's me. <laughs> She's learning how to delegate very well. I'm just. Uh... Why don't we just nominate yeah. Bill? Well, Bill will not it, be available. It goes through 2026. So. Yes, thank well, you. You don't have to be a member of the school committee. To be That's right. Okay. Yeah, it could be a, it could one, be a Okay, one representative or designated. I am very happy to take this job over so I can control it, Mr. Thielman. <laughs> Mr. Okay. Kind, so be careful. Okay. Just thought it was a good idea. Thank you. It was a good I don't think we did a formal problem. Do you want a formal motion or you don't need a formal motion, right? No. All right. So are you assigning it to you, Mr. Hainer? Or community yes. relations. To community, community relations. relations yeah. I, will, okay. I will contact Mr. Hurd and get the full details and report back to the committee as soon as possible. Do you like how I passed that right back to you? Document pretty much. The details are in the document. <laughs> it's <laughs> okay. like watching ping pong. <laughs> and I feel like we have a little bit of time, right? Yes. <laughs> well, I, I was like, this is quite the plan, but apparently. Okay, um, the consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless the member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant number 22232, dated April 19th, 2022, in the amount of $758,570.10. Uh, regular meeting minutes dated April 14th, 2022, and the organizational meeting minutes dated April 14th, 2022. So move. Second. <laughs> Motion by Mr. Hainer, second by Mr. Thielman. Roll call vote. Mr. Hainer? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. And I am a yes. That is a unanimous vote. All right, subcommittee liaison reports and announcements Budget, Dr. Allison Ampey. Budget will be arranging a meeting either next week without the superintendent or the week after with. Um, I'll discuss what works best. Thank you. Community relations, Mr. Hainer. Thanks to the chair, we will be having a meeting. I will arrange it with members as soon as possible. Uh, <laughs> curriculum instruction assessment and accountability, Ms. Morgan. Also, I uh, need to make some kind of a plan, which will be done imminently, I'm sure. <laughs> Facilities, Mr. Thielman. When we get the report back from the uh, Addison, we'll schedule a meeting. That's probably going to be later in May, right? Yeah, sometime later in May. Okay. Policies and procedures, Mr. Schlickman. We're going to need to schedule a meeting as soon as the superintendent returns. Uh, high school building committee, Mr. Thielman. Tours this Saturday, 540 people, something like that, have signed up so far. So go to AHS building dot org sign up come saturday from 10 a.m to 2 p.m it's going to be fun we and may we need sorry. volunteers too. yeah that's yeah, we, what so I we was need volunteers say, so if you want to volunteer to help kind of direct things um you could you, just, you don't need to know anything about the wings you can just yeah. you're just standing there to be a adult present there'll be children i mean there'll be students and stuff too um but uh, I think I'll send the link around to everyone, and if you're willing and able to serve a two-hour shift, that would be wonderful. Uh, I checked the sign-ups before meeting, and we definitely are in need of some more bodies. So, and I, I suspect we may have well over 500 people. Yeah, we we got a lot I, coming. I, yeah. Yeah. It's gonna be a big day. It's gonna be a big day. So, thank you. Oh, draw. Great. Oh, that's exciting. Uh, liaison reports. Uh, I'll just note again, the um, AF uh, 5K is coming up on Sunday, May 15th uh, at 8 a.m., right, bright and early. The registration is full. You can still participate in the virtual 5K if you're interested. 
Um, but they're very excited to have their first race be fully subscribed. Great, thank you. Lauren, what do you think your time will be this time? <laughs> not running. <laughs> I gotta help set up, but I'm not gonna run. <laughs> I would just like to note that there are mile markers along each of the um, miles for the route and the strategic planning work that we're doing with um, the partnership and the support of AEF is mile marker number two. So as you go by, you can celebrate strategic planning <laughs> as, you, as you pass mile two. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Announcements? Mr. Hainer? Uh, I'd like to share with the community and the committee that the third grade at Thompson will be having their mock town meeting. Uh, next Thursday, nine o'clock at the town hall. So they will, they have their articles all set and they will be debating them and we'll be going forward, looking forward to it. Uh, future agenda items, Ms. Keith. Hi, the AEA would like some time to discuss a potential endorsement from the school committee for the fair share amendment, which is going to be a ballot question in November. Um, and then I just, if committee members have things that they would like for the fall, um, curriculum presentations, or I've asked um, AEF to come do a presentation for us in June before the end of the year, um, feel free to email Ms. Diggins and she can send it on to me, but be thinking about what, what you might like to hear about in the fall. Mr. Hainer. The superintendent uh, and uh, the chair, uh, I assume we'll have specific items that they're going to have on a regular basis. So if you could give us a broad outline yeah. of what's coming each month, it will help us to, to, to either add or not bring things up that, since you've already scheduled them. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. To conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Collective bargaining may also be conducted. Approval of minutes from April 14th, 2022 executive session. We will not be returning from executive session into open session. Is there a motion to enter? So move. Second. Motion by Mr. Hainer, second by Mr. Thielman. Roll call vote, Mr. Hainer? Yes. Mr. Carden? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Allison Yampi? Yes. And I vote yes. It's a unanimous vote. So we will enter executive session. Do I bag this? 